Welcome to episode 30 of the Gluttons for Punishment podcast or GFP at Toronto Maple Leafs, an NHL podcast hosted by Michael Lapore and Anthony Bruno. He's Lapore. I'm Bruno. Thank you so much for listening and watching us on YouTube as well. If you're a new listener and you enjoy the show, we would really appreciate it if you give us a five star rating and review on Apple. And if you're watching on YouTube and you like what you see, it would be a big time help if you smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, and ring the notification bell so you know exactly when the GFE podcast is posting some new content. All right, everybody. As of Sunday, August 1st, 2021, NHL free agency is pretty much wrapped up. All the big hmm. names have signed at this point. There's still a few names out there that have not decided on their landing spots yet, but rosters across the NHL are taking shape. So we're going to get into that. A lot of Leafs talk in this episode. We're going to break down all the free agent signings. We're going to talk about some of the players that left in free agency as well. We're going to talk Habs and Oilers. We're going to get into a bunch of stuff in this episode, and I promise you don't want to miss it. But before we get into all that, it is time to welcome in my partner in crime, Mr. Michael Lapore. How you doing, man? I'm doing very well, Anthony Bruno. It's a long weekend. I'm happy to say that. Everyone have an enjoyable, safe, long weekend. Raining cats and dogs here in Ottawa on this precious Sunday. Kind of depressing. But GFP podcast to cheer me up. Episode 30. Shout out to Terry Sawchuk who was part of the dynamic duo of goaltenders that won the Stanley Cup for the Leafs in 1967. And also a side shout out to Alan Bester. Uh, fun fact about Alan Bester, he was the first ever Maple Leafs player that I opened a pack of hockey cards and discovered. So there you go. Oh, love it, Lepore. Vivid in my memory. The first Maple Leafs card, Upper Deck 1991, Alan Bester sliding to try to bring the puck in. Yeah. Awesome, man. Awesome. I love that. All right, man. Let's let's just get right into this episode. Let's get right into this mess. <laughs> we got a lot of signings to talk about here. But before we get into the new additions to this Toronto Maple Leafs roster, let's talk about some of the players that have left the team and signed elsewhere. As tears roll down our face. And of course, we have to start with Zachary Hyman, who signed a seven-year contract for $5.5 million a season with the Edmonton Oilers. So, Lapore, yep. just give me your take on Zach Hyman signing in Edmonton. Uh, happy for Zach. Happy that he uh, signed that kind of deal. We loved Zach in Toronto. One of those things that... Uh, I think it's one of those things that you don't realize what you had until it's gone. And I think uh, as the season goes forward and we're trying to find a player or players to insert in the top six, we're really going to realize uh, how important Zach Hyman was. Um, that all being said, it was the time of his career, meaning age, and the amount of money he was going to get with the ending of his contract that I'm very happy the Leafs stayed away from. That deal he got in Edmonton is a big contract for that type of player. We went over it last week. His age, he's 29, his injury problems... What did you say the last time he played an entire season was like two, three years ago? I think you mentioned that. 2017, 2018. Yeah. There's a, I mean, he's like a soccer analogy where people say like, there's a lot of miles on those legs. There's a lot of miles on Zach Hyman's legs. So to give him the seven year deal is a big, big risk for the Edmonton Oilers. And what's crazy is that they would have given him eight. If, if, that, if that deal took place, like signing Zach Hyman until he's 37 years old and I don't know, like the thing you're hearing said a lot around the hockey world is like, quote unquote, it's the next GM's problem. And uh, one of these deals or a deal like this, I should say, uh, could very well fall into that category. I'm trying to figure out the mindset of Ken Holland when pulling the trigger on something like that. It's like, let's face it, like Ken Holland's an experienced guy. I mean, went through the Red Wings, won cups. There's a lot of respect in the hockey world or like at, uh, to do with Ken Holland. So for him to give a deal like that, I don't know. I mean, I, I can't justify it. I think other than that, 
if he's just thinking I'm giving this guy a big long contract and I'm probably not going to be here for that uh, that length of time. And that's not a shot at Ken Holland. That just has to do with like the lifespan of a National Hockey League general manager. So it's an intriguing one. I mean, how do you feel about the loss of Zachary Hyman? Yeah, I'll start with this. I love Zach Hyman. I mean, I talked about it as well on the last show. He plays the game the right way, as we all like to say. I mean, he's he's just everything you want in a hockey player. He leaves it all out on the line. He can play in so many different situations. Mm-hmm. Power play, penalty kill, five on five. This guy does it all. He can play with the best players on your team. He can play in a third line role. Like there's just so many different things he can do. He's so versatile. And I think he's going to do really well in Edmonton playing with either Connor McDavid or Leon Dreisaitl. But saying all that, I think that's the exact contract you have to avoid signing guys in free agency. Like when you when you're committing 7 years to a player like this, okay? Here's my thing with NHL free agency. You either go all in on like a superstar elite level player and you know, you could put John Tavares in that category. You could even put Dougie Hamilton in that category for that matter. Right. And we'll get into that later in the show. Or you kind of go the the on the other end of the spectrum and you sign guys for cheap. And I'm not saying you got to sign guys for, you know, under 2 million, under a million. And I know the Leafs made a lot of those signings, but anytime you're you're signing guys to like over five-year deals, you're giving them a lot of term, you're paying five million dollars plus. You're getting into trouble if that player is a middle of the road player. And that's kind of what Zach Hyman is. You said it, Lepore. Like, this guy has missed 21% of games over the last three seasons, hasn't played a full season since 2018, hasn't had more than 41 points in a season. So, you know, we talked about his goal scoring ability. I said on the last show, he was third on the Leafs over the last three seasons in goals per game, which is great. You know, he played well with you know, McDavid and McDavid with Matthews and Marner and Tavares and Nylander. You know, there was, there was a lot of times where he was the third guy on both of those lines. Right. But man, oh man, this guy hasn't had over 41 points in a season and you're committing a seven year deal to him. What was his pace? The shortened year, like the COVID year to, I guess, two years ago. He was on like a 30, it was around a 30 goal pace. Yeah. So So I'm I'm asking his point. Yeah. I'm asking what his points, I guess points pace must've been pretty high yeah so that season laporte 37 points in 51 games okay well that's something so yeah if you want to look at that pace over an 82 game season that's a 59 point pace i was gonna say so he would have had somewhere around a 60 point season so that's a little unfair of me to say but just looking at the raw numbers has not recorded more than 41 points in a season had that season in 2020 where he was on pace for 59 points and yeah, just committing seven years to a player like that. Again, like I think short term, it's it's fine. He's going to mm-hmm. do well. Oh, yeah. Next couple seasons. But as the years go on, I think that contract is going to look worse and worse. And I think just the way that Zach Hyman plays, I don't think he's going to age gracefully. Yeah. At the end of the day, like let's call free agency what it is. Like you're gambling. And like there's good gambles. There's bad gambles. There's deals that I don't really see as a gamble. And no one can tell me this deal is not a gamble. Like the Edmonton Oilers are like taking a risk here and they know that. And as we've seen from free agency in the past, it more often than not, or almost always does not work out well. If you're ever having a bad day and you want to uh, give yourself a laugh, just go back to previous July 1st and see like the names that were signed in oh, the amount hilarious. of cash there was. It's hilarious. Like a few years, you see like Milan Lucic, like he was given what? Like, like, like on what planet? But so yeah, egregious. I mean, yeah, we should have worked harder in practice uh, to be NHL hockey players because uh, these contracts, uh, these GMs, they can't get out of their own way. So no, it's crazy. And just one last point about Zach Hyman. He is now the third highest paid forward on the Oilers roster behind. Who are the first two? Behind <laughs> McDavid and Drysidle, yeah, obviously. Okay. And like, my oh, other okay. thing is like, if you're Connor McDavid here. Like I said this on the last show as well. Like it, as much as you, as he probably likes the Zach Hyman signing, and you know the hockey world over the last three years really got to know the type of player he was playing in a massive market like Toronto. But you're telling me that you can't, like, you can't do better than Zach Hyman as Connor. 
I'll challenge that though, Bruno. But like, see, because McDavid's so talented. Is that like, like, I, I like what's in your eyes? What's the ideal player to put with Connor McDavid? Like a shooter, a pass? Because I mean, I think Hyman's going to fit in well. Like he's going to bang in a lot of garbage. He's going to clear up space. I mean, I don't think he's like a perfect fit for it, but. No, like you made a good point. In, in, like in terms of guys, like playing, anyone could play with Connor McDavid. Like yeah. you have to be just trash at hockey to not put up like 30 points playing with Connor McDavid. So I, I, I think he's going to do well. And I think, like you said, being like the banger on that line who's going to go to the dirty areas, you know, shovel goals home in front of the net. He's going to do well. But like, can we just get like a high skill winger to play with me? And, and again, I go back to the Leafs. It's like, you got Marner and Nylander on the wings. Like, you know, and you could make fun of Edmonton all you want and being like, oh, they should have just kept Taylor Hall instead of making that Taylor yeah. Hall for Adam Larson trade. Like, even someone like that, Lepore, even honestly, even a guy like Mike Hoffman, who we'll get into as well, who signed with the, the Montreal Canadiens, but just a little bit more of a higher ceiling guy, like someone who's capable of scoring 30 goals. And maybe Zach Hyman is going to score 30 goals that season or next season. But um, yeah, I, I just think if you're Connor McDavid, you're probably thinking like, can we just do like a little bit better here yeah. in terms of getting me some more talent on the wing? But but yeah, at the end of the day, Lepore, I think we're both in agreement that that Hyman is going to be a good fit with the Oilers, specifically in the short term. At that amount of money, say, like, what would have been the ideal amount of term? Like, for Hyman, I'm not giving him more than a four- or five-year deal. Four, yeah. Yeah, I think that would have been the money spot, four to five years. Four jumped out to me. Yeah. Yeah. Especially seeing what Taylor Hall signed for, re-signing with the Boston Bruins, that four-year, $6 million contract. Right. Like, I think that would have been a very nice term for Zach Hyman. But Yeah, true. All right, Lepore, let's move on here. Um, Another... Long time leaf. I mean, I don't know if you want to call him a long time leaf, but it seemed like he was on the leaf forever. Freddie Anderson. <laughs> you said that like in a condescending way. Like it felt like he was here forever. Felt like the guy um, was here for a decade. But yeah, uh, we, went, he, we went through he, a lot with Freddie. He moved on to the Carolina Hurricanes, signing a two year deal for four and a half million dollars a season. Yeah. And Lapore, we talked about this. I believe it was a couple shows ago where we were going over like what Freddie Anderson would get in free agency. We did. And yeah. he made it very clear that he wanted like something around the five million dollar mark. And I'm sure he wanted a longer term and he still views himself as a number one goalie in the NHL. And and I had a feeling, Lapore, that there was going to be a team out there that was probably going to meet his asking price. Now, Carolina clearly did not meet like the term that Freddie Anderson probably wanted. But four and a half million dollars. Uh, give me your take on on Freddie joining the Canes. <sighs> this is a kind of in between one because, like, for a starting goalie, it's not that bad. I mean, four point five million. What you're gonna get out of Freddie? I mean, that's in the air because, uh, as we saw with Freddie over the last five years, you can really get uh, it can really go either direction with him. So again, Carolina's taking a shot. Like they signed a name and, and that's always like the term you hear like to try to avoid when it comes to free agency signings. But Freddie Anderson's a name. You mentioned Hyman, the hype that comes with playing in Toronto. Freddie Anderson is the same type of player. And Carolina's taking, I mean, it's a, it's two years. And, and that's where like people always look at the dollar amount. But no, like I'm sure you would agree and most people would agree is where you get into a serious, real and serious danger is with term. So like, okay, things aren't going the best for Freddie Anderson in Carolina. You can try. It's not that hard to move him because he only has a year left, or it's only one year left. <laughs> so it's kind of how, how you you can see the perspective on it. And hey, if he's healthy, it can turn out really well. He gets you know he gets all pumped to be in a, a new environment. He's going to deal with a hell of a lot less pressure playing in Carolina. So I, I guess with Freddie, like we all know what Freddie is when he's healthy. And even maybe if it's between the years, like there was stuff going around about you know where his head was at and his confidence. So if like that's figured out. If he's healthy, I think it's okay. Like, I think people just saw the 4.5 and were like, whoa. But we saw Freddie at its best. What's weird for me is, and I'll ask you this as another Leaf fan, how will Freddie be remembered in Toronto? Ooh, that's a really good question. That's a weird one. Like, You know what? Unfortunately, Lepore, I think a lot of people were left with a sour taste in their mouth just based on how it ended over the last couple of seasons. And I know he was injured 
most of last season, but you know, going back to some of his playoff performances in Boston and you know what people forget that he was really good in that Columbus series mm-hmm. in 2020. But I think unfortunately, Lapore, a lot of people are going to kind of have like negative thoughts about Freddie Anderson and, and thinking that he was the number one, he was supposed to be a number one goalie came in with, with high expectations, but, but just didn't deliver. And he was obviously a part of this, this core that hasn't been able to deliver yet. So yeah, I think a lot of people are are kind of I don't know I I don't think people are, are think that highly of him to be honest. Yeah, kind of like recency bias kicks in. So like people forget how good he was, man. Those like first two three years, like you remember what there was one series. I think it was the first series against Boston where he was phenomenal. Like up until Game Seven, he he played amazing. And there was the Game Six, he made that late stick save, if I remember correctly. So yeah, a lot of good from Freddie. Like we all love Freddie. Um, again, happy you got paid. Way to go, brother. <laughs> yeah, like Freddie Anderson, his first three years with the Leafs, 918 save percentage, 918 save percentage, 917 save percentage, those first three seasons, and played over 60 games in every season. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure like a lot of like, the underlying numbers of like scoring chances, all that, like he was among the best goalies in the league. Like, like uh, the, he he kind of, how do I put this? Like, he kind of gave the Leafs a mask because like everyone knew no pun intended for a goalie. Um, he kind of gave the Leafs a mask as far as like how, how bad their D was. Like we all knew that the D wasn't good, but the underlying numbers showed that it was really bad. It was just Freddie Anderson was very, very good at that time. Yeah. I mean, he, he had a solid career with the Leafs. Like he, he really did. And you know, Lou Lamorello signed him to that five year, $25 million contract. And you know, yeah. at the time he hadn't really played that much with Anaheim like the most the he had played 54 games that was the most games he had played in a season so people were still like a little bit worried in terms of like okay he's only played like three seasons in the NHL he hasn't been like the full-time number one starter and you know what things ended up turning out like pretty solid obviously like I said the end of his Leafs tenure did not go well but in terms of Carolina, like I think it's a fine number to sign Freddie at, especially since it's only a two-year deal. And if you're going to get the Freddie Anderson from a couple of years ago when he was around that 917, 918 save percentage, then that's going to be really good for them. And I just found it really interesting with Carolina how they just completely like went away with all of the goaltending that they had. Yeah. So they trade Alex Nedeljkovic, who was their starter in the playoffs. He was phenomenal last season as a rookie. Traded him to Detroit. James Reimer out the door. And then obviously Peter Morazic, who we'll get into in more detail, signed with the Leafs. And now they're going with Freddie Anderson and Auntie Ranta. Yeah, random. And like they and, signed... And- they signed D'Angelo too. It was a weird one. Like Carolina, I don't know. Yeah, different. they've been making some interesting decisions. And then they lose Dougie Hamilton yeah. as well. Yeah. Their stud defenseman. So some interesting decisions from Carolina. But yeah, they have a completely new goaltending tandem this year. And Ronta's a guy who I think he's he's really good as well. Like that's a guy who can put up a 920 save percentage. He's had injury problems. But but yeah, like that Freddie, Ant- like good for Freddie. He got his four and a half million. And you know what? I, I genuinely hope that he rebounds and, and kind of regains his form oh, yeah. from years past. Oh, yeah. Kind of like, like Hyman. We'll be rooting for Freddie for sure. Exactly. All right, Laporte. Uh, next on our list here is a player that Kyle Dubas traded a first round pick. <sighs> there we go. <laughs> and was it multiple fourth round picks? It was a first and, and two fourths Don't for Nick me. Foligno. Awesome. At the trade deadline, and I think as all Leaf fans know, Nick Foligno did not score a single goal as a Toronto Maple Leaf. Now, I know he dealt with injuries. He had a back issue in the playoffs. It looked like that dude could barely move. So, you know, I wish things had gone better with that Nick Felino experiment. And I think if he was healthy, things probably would have gone better. But he has now moved on and signed... With the Boston Bruins, a two-year deal for three point eight million a season. Lapore, give me your reaction on Felino signing in Boston. Ah, they're gonna love Nick. They're gonna love that Italian mug in Boston. He's a Bruins player. He's gonna give it his all. He's gonna get dirty once in a while. I think Felino is gonna have an absolute blast there. And like I said, the Bruins fans are gonna love what Nick Felino brings. It just sucks. Like it, it's it's so gross what happened. 
during his time in Toronto of like what we gave up for him and then him getting hurt. It just, it could have been something awesome. Like, like, like kind of a lot of things that were pointing in the right direction last year. It was like, this feels right. You know, like, like, like his dad playing for the Leafs and like, you know, the famous overtime winner and Nick coming aboard wearing his dad number, his dad's number. And it seemed like immediately he was a likable guy. And there were talks that like there was some negotiations with the Leafs, like how deep it went, who knows. But again, like the three got Hyman, Anderson, and now Felino, like likable guys. You're, you're going to be rooting for them, and it sucks to see them go. Um, but I mean, at that number, like at the number he got, would you have resigned Felino? Or you think the Leafs seriously considered that? That's tough. And and I read reports that the Leafs were in the mix. So I think they definitely tried to re-sign him. But mm. I mean, we all know the Leafs of their salary cap issues and they can only go to a certain, you know, dollar figure for for certain players. And especially when you look at a guy like Nick Felino, like that's not someone you want to overpay for, right? Yeah. Uh so yeah, like I mean, would I have brought him back for 3.8 million? Uh, you know what, Lapore? I probably would have just moved on as yeah. well and yeah. and i don't know if the leafs offered him the same deal like i would imagine the leafs probably offered around three million like i can't imagine that they got that high just based on their their cap situation but no like you said man like that's a situation that could have went so well like it, it seemed right mm-hmm. like everything surrounding his dad and just the way he plays and the leader that he is it seemed like it was like the perfect final ingredient that the Leafs needed to go on on a playoff run, but I mean it it, it, uh, it crashed and burned. Like let's let's yeah. not sugarcoat it here. Like Nick Foligno played eleven games, seven regular season games, four playoff games, did not score a single goal. He did have five assists, but yeah, I mean it was it was brutal to trade a first round pick and you know a couple fourth round picks for you know eleven games of a player that stings. And that's a mistake. You know, I don't even necessarily want to call it a mistake, but I think it's it's a learning lesson for Kyle Dubas. And I think now, even heading into next year's trade deadline, like, you know, maybe it'll make him sort of rethink, you know, trying to add a player like that who's up there in age. And weren't there rumors, Lapore, that he was, like, injured, like, heading into Toronto on that deal? Yeah, that I don't know if I believe. I don't know if I believe concerns? that. I don't know if I believe that. Like at that level, at that level, I think the due diligence is done. Like maybe there was something lingering and then something happened. Who knows? But I would like to think and hope that the Toronto Maple Leafs as like an organization <laughs> and just beyond hockey, like a company, like do their legwork when it comes to finding out if they're going to bring in like a tainted asset. But yeah. yeah. No, but if no, you look that's back, totally like, fair. But, but like to your point about like Dubas at next deadline, the Leafs have no picks left, man. If I remember correctly, we, the Leafs only have like, I think a first and a second next year as it stands now. And again, like if I, if I mentioned before, if you want to get a good laugh, if you're having a bad day, like go look at free agency signings, you want to get depressed, go over the Leafs deadlines from the last few years. And like, it, it's a kick in the nuts because I mean, they haven't won around. Let's call a spade a spade, but everything they gave away at the deadline, like it was a second for Boyle, a second for Placanic. Now they, they, they gave away a first for uh, for Felino. All those other picks they gave away for like other like complimentary players. If I were correctly seeing it, the Leafs have essentially given away a draft, like in, in the last yeah, five much. years. And, and people and people have like shot on it like completely. And I would respond like I'd like to see where other teams sit in that too. Like if you looked like the Pittsburghs of the world, the Boston's, like the teams that like you know they're going for it. And if people how how those teams won rounds and yeah, but and I mean the Leafs were trying to win rounds. It's just that it doesn't look as bad because those teams advance and like with the Leafs, like I'm sure it's not that different with those teams and what they've given away over the last five years. Cause at the end of the day, they're trying to get better. Like even a team like Tampa, like they seem to always like make like a, like a nice move at the deadline. So over five years, I mean, yeah, you're going to give up a lot, but again, yeah. it just, it just sucks to see it knowing they never won around. Yeah. And I think another thing that fans were a little bit upset with is seeing what the Taylor Bruins yeah. gave up for Taylor Hall. And he performed really well as a Bruin. I mean, obviously, they got eliminated in the playoffs as well. Didn't they get knocked out? They got knocked out in the second round to the Mm -hmm. Islanders. But they gave up a second-round pick and Anders Bjork for Taylor Hall. And Mm -hmm. he was 10 times better 
of an acquisition than Nick Felino. So I think Leaf fans look at that and be like, wow, we gave up a first and other picks for Nick Felino while Boston gave up a second and Anders Bjork for Taylor Hall. And now he's re-signing with them on a on a very nice contract, four years, six million per. So yeah, yeah I think Leaf fans are a little bit upset about how that all went down. But yeah, at the end of the day, Lapore, you said it. It's easy to root for a guy like Nick Felino. He he seems like he's a Boston Bruin, and I think he's gonna fit in very well yeah. in that Bruins lineup. So so good for Nick and all the best to him. Uh Lapore, so the the last name on our list here, he wasn't an integral part of the team last year, but I think he started to grow on fans as the season went on. And that player is Zach Bogosian. Yes. Who, after a w- winning the Stanley Cup with the Tampa Bay Lightning in 2020, he signed with the Leafs on a one-year deal, and now he's going right back to Tampa. Why because, not? I mean, who doesn't want to play in oh Tampa at this point for that team, in that climate, for that organization? I mean, it just seems like like a dream to play for that team. And we've seen some, some other um, veteran guys go there, you know, Corey Perry's another guy that comes to mind, but uh, Zach Bogosian Lapore, three-year deal with the Lightning for only eight hundred fifty thousand a year. It was a three-year. I thought it was a two-year deal. It was a three-year deal. Yeah, three-year deal with the oh, Lightning okay. for eight hundred fifty k per. That's good. like why, even him. Like, why would he sign that? I know that's kind of bizarre because I I feel like he could have got something better than that. Even like, like less term, more yeah, like or three years more. I don't know, like either term or i mean he's not gonna sign for longer at that amount it, it, that 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 three years at that amount is weird yeah like you're telling me there wasn't a team out there willing to offer him like 1.5 a year i was gonna say like a, a two-year deal or even, even like a two times 1.5 like you think a team would yeah. give him that like I, I don't know weird but i guess maybe he just doesn't care and he really wanted to go back there and that little bit of difference doesn't matter so but it's just so like I, like when certain things happen, they're just so kind of like obvious. And there were rumors, actually, a lot of rumors going around about his opinions on the lockdowns here in Canada. And that kind of slammed the door shut on negotiations with uh, signing again with the Leafs because he's was not happy with how our government handled situations. And that, that's a whole other topic. But I, I, I just think, man, that, like I, I'm pretty sure I've said it before on this show. Playing for can playing in Canada is hard. It's different. And like this league is different than the NBA and the NFL, where guys like, you know, they embrace playing in a big market. They want to be the man. Like, even even say baseball, like you never hear like, oh, so and so does not want to play for the Yankees or Red Sox or Dodgers. Like you never hear that. Or imagine the NBA, no, nah, you know what? I don't want to go to the Lakers. Never. Like you never hear, but in hockey, it, it just seems like guys will venture down south it's less intense down there there's less pressure and i know there's pressure to win but you just deal with less overall you throw in sunshine i mean it's just it's harder for canadian teams it's just harder and like i'll even say it man like you look around you look around the league or look around the canadian teams i should say like we all suck like, like we're all it's, it's kind of sounds fun it sounds funny like you know montreal just made the final but like and i know like the media pumps it more but like all these canadian teams like we can really easily pick on all of them like either because of like drama or these signings they make or how they handle things like it's just like we just all get in a circle and laugh at each other because it's like one bad move or weird move or funny experience like after another you know what i mean and I remember, I think I remember hearing Brian Burke on a podcast once, and he said 99% of the time, no movement clauses, no trade clauses are because players are players don't want to play in Canada. Wow. Period. Yeah. It's like that's the reason. Like you can't trade me to these seven teams. I'm on because they, they just don't want to deal with it. Like being from Ottawa, I remember like remember Joe Corvo, remember he was like an offensive defenseman. Yeah. He came out and said he's like, I hated going to the grocery store and getting stopped every time and people saying things and whether it's positive or negative. You know what I mean? Just or you can go play in Tampa, where there's Tom Brady and a lot of other distractions from sports fans, and you're not too far from no a one lot even of knows who things. you are. Oh my god, no way. And even and even too, like like little things. Like I've spent a lot of time in Florida. People talk about the tax, and like there's a lot of debate like in the hockey world, but like how much the tax thing actually helps you. 
because if you have the, the proper accounting, like you can make out the same amount of money, but something as simple as like sales tax, remember correctly in Florida is like 6%. So it is less than half of what you pay here in Canada. So it's like, well, everything you buy is that much cheaper. It's like, there's different like write-off regulations in these, in the, in the U S in different States. Like you can write off personal things. Like you, it's, it's just better <laughs> at the end. It's not even about hockey. Like it's better to be a millionaire, a multimillionaire in the U S and especially in certain States compared to Canada or Ontario, or Quebec. So to me, that's this whole, this deal just like slaps us in the face with that, that like life is better for this guy somewhere else. And that place is Tampa. So it's just like, yeah, the rich got richer and another Canadian team gets laughed at. And that's it. And again, like the other guys, it sucks to see Bogosian go. He's a great piece, great signing. Everyone loved him. It's, he's one of those guys too. Like you think of the guys who left. So you had him leaving, you had Felino leave. Both of those guys in a full building, they would have like, I'm, I know like fan favorite. It doesn't really matter if the building's full or not, but I think it would have been increased because of the fans. You put 18,000 people in that building. I think people will start to love them more because it, like their emotions just ooze in the way they play. And again, like Bogosian was that guy. It's another slap in the face to us because he was a nice piece and it sucks to see him go. But you know what? I don't blame Zach Bogosian one bit because... Yeah. Who the hell wants to play for the Toronto Maple Leafs? <laughs> <laughs> when you can go play for the Tampa Bay Lightning, a team that you won the Stanley Cup with in 2020. And I think it was simple as that. I, I think he he enjoyed his experience so much Join and I believe he joined Tampa at the trade deadline in 2020. I think you're right. I think you're right. Yeah. And I think he enjoyed that experience so much. And he's the same age as Steven Stamkos. And I'm, I think they're pretty close friends. And, you know, everything we just talked about, all the perks that come with playing in Florida, being out of the spotlight, I think it was a no brainer decision for Zach Bogosian. And, you know, clearly he thinks that he has a better chance to win a Stanley Cup there as well. You think he does? <laughs> Here's the thing, like, I I, I don't think they're gonna three peat. I really <laughs> I meant don't. it more as a joke. I meant it more as a joke, but you can go on a no. Rant. Okay, okay, no, like yeah. I. But here's the thing, like, I don't think they're gonna three peat. Like, yeah, I think they I mean, they've had a lot of turnover here. Obviously, all their stars are still in place. Yeah, and they're still a really good team. But yeah, I mean, that was obviously that was obviously in his decision making process as well, right? Like. <laughs> You ask anyone right now, they're all saying that Tampa Bay has a better chance to win the Stanley Cup this season than the Toronto Maple Leafs. Yeah. Can't even win a friggin' playoff series. But yeah, so you you factor all those things in. It was a no-brainer decision for Zach Bogosian. The only thing is like, why didn't he sign for more? But yeah. I don't think he cares because I'm sure that he's happy being exactly where he is on the Tampa Bay Lightning. It's weird to have players like that in your organization, eh? Who just like, don't just think all about the final dollar amount. Weird. Weird. I wonder what that's like. Instead, the Leafs then, have tied yeah. up 40 million of their <laughs> $82 million cap in Taking four players. Taking it all. Taking it all. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, Let's move on, Bruno. I said it, I already said it was raining out and it's a depressing day and you're making it worse. Yeah. It, it, it's time. It's time to move on. We thank all of those four players for their time. As Toronto Maple Leafs. Yeah. And now, Lepore, we have to usher in the new era of, of cheap <laughs> young guys. Yeah. The new era of the Toronto Maple Leafs coming yeah. at you. And uh, let's go over some of these names. So Star I want to start lineup. things off with Michael Bunting. Yes. Who I think is the most intriguing ad of everyone the Leafs signed in free agency. And there's a yeah, theme... And we'll get into that as we go through these names, just in terms of sort of the profile and the age and, you know, the position that a lot of these new signings play. I mean, most of them are forwards. But with Michael Bunting, it's a two-year deal for 950000 a year. Yeah. He's coming from the Arizona Coyotes organization. And he doesn't have a ton of NHL experience. Like, this guy has only played 26 games in the NHL. So 21 of those came last year. He scored 10 goals. 10 goals, three assists, but 10 goals. That jumped out at me for sure. Yep, yeah. 10 goals in 21 games. His shooting percentage was kind of high. And even Kyle Dubas in his uh, post-free agency press conference was talking about that, saying that- He pointed out his shooting percentage? Yeah, he did. He said his shooting um, percentage is going to come down. Like we shouldn't expect him to 
you know, to yeah, light the lamp and score yeah. 30 goals or anything like that. But, but he also played 16 games in the AHL this past season, had 19 points in 16 games. Yeah, he's a stud in the AHL. 49 yeah. points in 58 games in the AHL in 2020. Um, you know, everyone loves to to joke around about this, but yes, he played for the Sioux Greyhounds in the Ontario Hockey League where Sheldon Keefe coached and Kyle Dubas was the general manager. So obviously there's some familiarity there mm. as well. But an interesting thing that I heard Dubas talk about Lacour about bunting is that they almost see him like a Zach Hyman type player where this guy's extremely tenacious. He's hard on the puck. He's tough to play against. Like he's not a big guy. He's he's five eleven and a little under two hundred pounds. Yeah, I saw that. So it's not like he's a huge guy or anything like that. But he can he can kill penalties as well if he needs to. So this is a guy that I think is hungry, and I think is going to get an opportunity to play in the top six. Definitely. And I'm sure that they're going to experiment in training camp and and see how he looks alongside Matthews and Marner and Tavares and Nylander and kind of decide from there. But uh, yeah, he's also only 25 years old. So Lepore, give me your take on this Michael Bunting signing. Because like I said, I think this is the most intriguing of all the players the Leafs have added this offseason. Yeah, like I think this one has the, and I'm not saying it's going to be (laughs) before everyone attacks me, but this one has the opportunity to be a jackpot, both in the way of looking at this guy's production at the AHL level and you mentioned how high his shooting percentage was, but it's hard to score goals in the National Hockey League. Like, even if that drops in half to, like, a more reasonable shooting percentage, I mean, he would have had five goals. Five goals in 21 games played. So, it's pretty good, man. That, that, that's a 20-goal pace. And also, the second year. So, it's not even one of those ones where, like, hey, he comes in, he does great, and we're going to lose him because he's going to go make more money somewhere else. Imagine this guy has a great year. And we know we have a full second year of him, so I mean, this and the, so I think this is a really really good signing for the Leafs. Again, again, it's all about gambling. Like how I said earlier, what are you gambling here? Nothing, like or very little. I mean, or somebody else's money that's not mine, so I don't care, right? So no, I like it. I like that one a lot for uh, for the boys in blue. And here's the thing, Lapore. Like even if the Leafs did have a lot of cap space, like let's say they had the cap space that the Oilers had. Like, I wouldn't want them to go out there and sign, like, you know, these middle-of-the-road players to, like, five-year deals for five or six million or that Zach Hyman seven-year, five-and-a-half million AAV. Like, these are the type of signings that I'd want my team to make, even if they had a lot of cap space. To your point, someone posted it. Zach Hyman signed for $5.5 million. Bunting, Kampf, Kasha, and Richie are combined 5.9. There you go. Yeah. And not saying, I mean, if you debate all day long, but people know what my point is on that. So the irony of it. Yeah. I I just think that it's more, I think when you look back at the history of free agency, I mean, you mentioned it, Lepore, like most of these deals on July 1st, I mean, obviously this year it wasn't July 1st, but most of the deals on, you know, the first couple of days of free agency, they end up being terrible Yeah, down the road. They just (laughs) do. And, and I just think it makes a lot more sense to gamble on guys like this and hope that Michael Bunting, maybe he becomes the next Zach Hyman, right? Mm-hmm. He's only 25 years old. Maybe you you hit on a guy like this and he ends up being a 20 goal scorer for the next couple of seasons and you're getting him for under a million dollars, right? And, yeah. and I think the Leafs took a lot of bets on similar type of players. Oh, that's what it all is, Bruno. It's that, that's, that's, it's, it's yeah. really as simple as that. But yeah, like, in, for Michael Bunting, like this is a guy who I think has the most. I don't, you know what? I'll say it. I, I actually think he he probably has the most upside of all the forwards that they signed. You this think? Season. Like upside in the way of a signer or a, of an actual player, like an actual player. Like I, I think this really? dude. I think this dude legit can be like a full time member of the top six. Okay. And who knows how it's going to shake out? Because we're going to go over the other signings the Leafs made as well, but. Okay, because like Richie got almost three times what he got. You yeah. think of it that way. I mean, if it's just like he, equal he's, play. He's a little bit more established, even though there's... 100%. Exact, yeah, 100%. Like he, he has a higher pedigree being a first-round pick, which we'll get yeah. into. But to your point about like the bets and like the irony of it. So the guys he picked up, Kampf is 26, Kasha's 25, Richie's 25, Bunting's 25. And there you go. It's not a, it's not a coincidence that they that went for the these guys. That was the theme. I was, yeah, I was they're trying to get guys peaking up at the right time on short 
cheap deals, right? And again, hopefully, and you you hope to hit on all of them. If you strike on one of these, it's awesome. And that's awesome. the thing, right? You sign a bunch of them and hope that two or three of these guys hit. And then you have flexibility to move guys out. I mean, there's a lot of things that could happen and shake out with this roster still, right? So Yeah, and, and everyone wants this signing. Like, like, let's just say what it is. Like, unless we get rid of Kerfoot, like, and maybe something else, like, we're not going to be able to sign, like, a name. And people what I know, know, uh, know what I mean by a name. And you see these other teams signing guys, like, oh, they, you know, they have cap space. Like, you know, they have cap space because they don't have – for like and i'll say it elite top six forwards like they're trying to get that and like here i am like pumping the and tires the Leafs already of, have that yeah I'm, here i'm pumping the tires of the leaves after this embarrassment of a season but like the fact of the matter is like marner matthews nylander tavares are excellent players in the top six so we don't need that <laughs> like the, the the scoring problem this year i mean this was i mean the scoring up front or the scoring up top i should say in the playoffs but if we had to circle a problem that has to be addressed for the leafs it's the help. It's the Mikheyevs of the world, the Yangvals of the world, the Kerfoots of the world, those guys producing. Like Robertson coming in, we hope we get contribution from him. And that's what you can tell they circled from the guys they signed, like trying to get that extra help, like scoring help. Yeah, it's really as simple as that. And like, I don't think Dubis and Keefe are going into the season being like, yeah, Bunting is going to play alongside Matthews and Marner and Nick Ritchie is going to play along to, alongside Tavares and Nylander. But what I do think is that they've, they've given themselves a lot of options and mm. they're just going to be patient. And they're going to say, you know what? We signed all these guys for cheap contracts. We still obviously have Kerfoot and Mikheyev. And these guys are going to fight for jobs. It's about and yeah. whoever plays well in training camp and whoever proves himself and whoever shows that they've taken their game to that next level, those players are going to get the first crack when it comes to playing alongside the core four in the top six. I saw someone else made the comparison to kind of like what Florida did last year when they signed a lot of guys like names, guys who really couldn't find their opportunity and they flourished. I mean, and they're not all going to flourish, but again, it's, it's, it's yeah, good. You look at like Carter Verhage, who was a former leaf. Yeah. And then on the oh, yeah. Florida Panthers, the guys like almost had a point a game. Yeah. Du- Duclair season. had a great year. Duclair was a weird one. Cause Duclair always put up points. I mean, there was it, the talk about the personal stuff like Tortorella called him out that time, but like he got his deal now, but again, they took shots at guys who could play. And like, there's a lot of talent out there. You just, just got to find it. You got to find it and get these guys in the right spot so they can produce. Yeah. Well said Lapore. All right, man. Yeah. So moving on now, I guess we can lump these two former Bruins together. Um, okay. But you mentioned it. The Leafs also signed Nick Ritchie and Andre Kasha. So yeah. Nick Ritchie coming in at two years, 2.5 million AAV and Andre Kasha one year, 1.25 million per well for that one season. So both of these guys have played for the Boston Bruins, starting with Nick Ritchie. Mm-hmm. So let's go back to that 2014 draft <laughs> and Don Jerry. The Leafs are on the board at eight and you know, a lot of speculation even heading into the draft is that they were eyeing Nick Ritchie because he's uh, that tough Ontario kid and the yeah. Leafs needed that power forward and needed to get, you know, bigger and tougher in the top six. And then the whole Don Cherry thing, right? Remember that? Oh my God. And the Leafs obviously ended up taking William Nylander, which turned out to be a great draft pick. Yeah, not bad. But Nick Ritchie went two picks later to the Boston Bruins, Don Cherry, absolutely, or sorry, to the Anaheim Ducks, I should say. At the time, yeah. At the, the Ducks. time, Don yeah. Cherry absolutely lost his mind. <laughs> Remember that coach's corner? I'd love to pull that up. He's like, I think Nylander like went back to Sweden for like some because whoever he was playing for at the time or whatever and don just going off about how he went back because he's scared he's scared of the online and him going off about how shanahan didn't have the guts to take the ontario boy i'm like oh my god just, well don just, got his wish we we got we finally got richie so oh god just a classic don cherry ontario boy rant but yeah, yeah it's come full circle now because after having a breakout season with the bruins last year so nick richie last season he had 15 goals. Yeah, 26 15 points. 15 goals in 56 games, 26 points. His best season in the National Hockey League. They did not give him a qualifying offer, so that's why he's a free agent at the age of 25. Yeah. And uh, even going back to like his draft year and just some videos that I saw popping up on Twitter, like 
he grew up as a Leaf fan. Like his dad was a Leaf fan. He's oh, from- then it's it's certain to work out then, Bruno. He's yeah, it always works out. <laughs> oh, Everyone who's man. from the GTA always flourishes as a member of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Can I say something? I've always thought this is kind of funny. The take for a while was that the Leafs didn't draft and pick up enough. Like Ontario boys was always like the saying, and they got shot on for that. And now it's like kind of like the joke. That like we get all these OHL guys and we kind of make fun of it because it's like ah it never works out so it's just just to show like Leafs fans or fans in general are never happy. Oh yeah, it, it's hilarious, man. But uh, no, things have come full circle, and he, you know, I was I was looking at some quotes from Nick Ritchie. He's he's really excited. Like the Leafs were were on his radar. He he toured the practice facility and he you know he looked at all the things that the Leafs had to offer, and for him it was essentially a no-brainer two years two and a half million he's going to get an opportunity to play with the big boys again we don't know who is going to be that third guy on those top two lines but Nick Ritchie is is clearly going to be in play to be one of those guys he signed the biggest deal of all these guys that we're going to talk about today yeah like you said he's established yeah so you know what Lepore like I, I like this signing and listen I'm not like a huge fan of of players like Nick Ritchie he doesn't skate very well but he's a big dude. He's 6'2", 230 pounds. He's not afraid to throw his weight around. He's going to lay hits. He's going to play physical. He's going to play mean. He can drop the gloves if he needs to. And, you know, like I said, he scored 15 goals last season. And if he does that over a full – like, I'd be happy, Lepore. If you get 15 to 20 goals out of Nick Ritchie oh my God. in an 82-game season, I think Leaf fans are jumping for joy. They'd be ecstatic, man. One thing – um, it's kind of going around about him. And it's funny, a buddy told me this, who's a, a buddy of mine who's a big Bruins fan told me this when we picked him up. And then Steve Dangle pointed it out in his review. And then I noticed just Norse in the stats. He takes a lot of penalties. Yes. That he is takes correct. a lot. And like my Bruins fan body was quick to say like a lot of stupid penalties. So like he was like, he was hated by a, by a lot of Bruins fans for that. So some just to throw some negativity at it, but hopefully you can clean that up because uh, you're not going to be, you're not going to be liked by too many fans in Toronto. If you're taking a lot of bad penalties. Yeah, exactly. And he's not going to be a favorite of Sheldon Keith. If he continues to go out there and take stupid penalties like he did last season with Boston. But, but again, like, I think this is a good bet to take on a player who can probably get better. And listen, he, he had the opportunity to play with quality players in Boston yeah, you know, <laughs> spending time on a line with David Krejci, and I'm sure he had exposure to their other star players as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, if he's going to get an opportunity to play with the Leafs core four, you would you would like to think that he's going to have a similar season, you know, scoring around 15, 20 goals and being a secondary scorer on this Leafs team. That's essentially all the Leafs are asking him to do. Yeah, like bring your physicality, chip in offensively. Like you said, Lepore, don't take stupid penalties. Just play your game, stay in your lane, and you're probably going to be successful on this team. Yeah, man. For sure. All right. So now let's quickly talk about Andre Kasha. Yeah. This, this, a movie could be written about this kid. <laughs> this is a, another very intriguing player because he's got talent. But the yeah. problem with Andre Kasha is that he just cannot stay healthy. Dude, I looked up where, where was it? What? website was i on he has like five noted concussions yeah, and he's in his mid, yeah in his mid 20 like five not good oh. he he only played three games last season with boston he had yeah. concussion issues all year so was the story pretty- did, did, did he not get hurt like in like the second game of the playoffs in the bubble and then he got hurt again like right at the start of this season for like it was a disaster for boston that they traded a first round pick for him eh yeah, I believe they did. Yeah, it was a deadline deal because they got rid of that. They got rid of Bacchus. I think he was involved yeah, in the Bacchus deal. It was the Bacchus yeah. deal. So he came the other way. And there was a first, and I'm sure that first round pick had a, lot, had a lot to do with like getting rid of Bacchus. But yeah, like there was potential for this kid and he was putting up numbers. But like you said, he just can't stay healthy. Yeah, that's the problem with Andre Kasha. Like you said, the concussion issues. I mean, this guy is essentially a walking band aid. But when you look at his numbers, so his. His best season in the NHL came in 2017-2018 with Anaheim. 20 goals and 38 points in 66 games. That's the one, yeah. Followed that up with 20 points in 30 games the next season. 
And then the season after that is when he got traded to the Boston Bruins. He ended up racking up four assists and 11 playoff games in the bubble. Um, But again, another guy who the Leafs are gambling on. And believe me, Kyle Dubas and Sheldon Keefe in that front office, they're not stupid. They're coming into the season probably anticipating that this guy's going to be injured at some point. (laughs) Yeah. And that's why they only signed him to a one-year deal. But if he actually stays healthy, and I'm not saying he has to play the full season, but if you get, you know, 80% of games from this guy, like he's another guy that can score 20 goals, Lepore. If he's playing with, especially with the core four. So again, this is, I think this is a very, it's super low risk. It has the potential to be a really quality signing on a one-year deal. And that it's really as simple as that. I mean, I don't think there's that much else we can really say about this guy. Yeah. One thing that's very like hashtag Toronto Maple Leafs is that his Corsi numbers are like bananas good. Like the geeks love this guy. So, I mean, whether that played into it, I'm sure it played into it because we all know what Kyle Dubas and Sheldon Keefe. But, yeah, I mean, he's a good player. <laughs> he's a good player. It's a matter if he can stay healthy and, like, Boston wasn't willing to do with anymore. And something so- someone pointed out, too, was here's this guy who dealt with everything he's dealt with um, as far as injuries go. And, like, let's face it, like, this probably is his last shot at getting a career in this league. He signed early. He signed early. Charlie, and I'm sure he just kind of wanted to get out of the way. And I read somewhere too, it kind of came on the Leaf side as well, that like, let's get this kid in. He can be evaluated, get healthy, the facilities, all that stuff. And we've sort of like a long summer with him to see where he's at physically. So, Yeah, and I think the big draw for a lot of these guys who are signing these cheap contracts is that they probably know that they're going to have a very good opportunity to play with the core four and boost their numbers. Yeah. So like at the very least, like I don't think all these players are coming in and being like, yes, I'm the final piece that's going to get the Leafs over the top and win them a Stanley cup. Now I'm sure most of them probably have that in the back of their heads, but I think a big draw is that, Hmm, if I prove myself and I get an opportunity to play with John Tavares and William Nylander as the third guy on that line, and I have a 20 goal season. Well, guess what? Cha-ching. Yeah. I've upped my value, right? And I think that's a lot of, I think that definitely plays into the decision making process. I, I don't think the sole reason that guys sign in certain places is to just win a Stanley Cup. And I think, you know, for people to think that is actually insane that the main reason that a lot of these guys are signing in certain places is strictly to win a championship. I get in discussions like like the car rides to hockey with my nephew of like you know, why'd this guy sign here? And I'm like, well, the game, a lot of money. He's like, yeah, but they're not good. I'm like, I know, buddy, but. But they just there. don't give a shit. <laughs> yeah, they don't. So you hate to tell a nine-year-old that, but. Uh, it's like, he, he was shocked to hear that Hyman left. So like, well, why'd he leave to go to Edmonton? Like, we're better than them, are we? It's like, you know, they give him a lot of money, pal. They give him a lot of money. So you make yeah, the best and, of it. And, and that's just the reality of the situation. People don't like to bring it up a lot of the times. We all like to say, you know, everyone plays to win a Stanley Cup. But, man, I'm telling you right now, there's a lot of other factors involved, and especially when guys are, are UFAs and they see these big contracts that are being dished yeah. out to them. I mean, this it's life-changing money. And for a lot of these guys, it's the one big contract they're ever going to sign in the NHL. And it's the one opportunity they have and you know i think you'd be crazy not to take it if you're a player yeah. like zach hyman like blake coleman you know guys like that who are signing some of these deals so yeah for, for me I've, what i've always pointed out and i think people so quickly forget because we, we get all fanboy about it is that you're dealing with people here and like it's like any other workplace any other environment where you have so many different personalities and so many different wants from people and even you even have people in different life phases like the guy who is 23 24 is not in the same phase of his life as like the vet with like a wife and two kids when and these playing to the decisions of okay where to play like um uh where do we want to live i guess specifically like are we happy here are we not like you guys it's all about money I mean, they'll leave one, they'll leave, and I'm talking about hawk here, any job, they'll leave their job for more money where other guys, you know, I'll take less money to be happy here. And just people try to like dissect it all the time. And at the end of the day, we don't know what's going on 
in these guys' lives and between their ears and like their family stuff and all the things that play into these decisions about where to play. So no, you nailed the Lapore. And there's exactly guys are at different stages of their lives, and especially the guys that have families. Yeah. And you know, you got to think about your kids and where they're going to school and things like that, and where they're you going always up. hear that. Eh? They always point that out, like where the kids go to school. I think that's like an underrated thing. Like yeah. again, let's face it, you're a millionaire. Your kids are probably going to some like prep school, something special. Like, do you want to pull them out of their prep school? Or if you do, you want to make sure there's an equivalent, like wherever you're going, like it's your family, man. Yeah. So there's so many different factors that come into play when these guys are signing contracts as UFAs. But yeah, I mean, in terms of uh, these two guys coming over from the Boston Bruins, not much else to say about them. But there's another guy we got to talk about, Lapore, and that is David Kampf. Yeah, David Kampf. He's another interesting one. So the Leafs, again, I mean, we talked about the underlying um, theme here. All these guys, 25, 26 years old, all with something to prove, all with that, you know, that opportunity to get better. They're not fully established yet, but they're also not, you know, super young and they have more room to grow. And David Camp is just another one of those guys. So the Leafs signed him to a two-year, 1.5 million AAV coming over from the Chicago Blackhawks. He only scored one goal last season in 56 yeah. games. It's and not he's jam. not a guy that's going to put up points. He's not a high octane offensive guy by any means. Like, you know, like for example, like Michael Bunting, he's not a high octane offensive guy and neither is Arkasha and Richie for that matter. But I think all three of those guys have a higher offensive ceiling than David Kampf. Yeah. And just listening to what Kyle Dubas said about David Kampf, um, you know, in his post-free agency press conferences and things like that. He said what really drew the Leafs towards him is his ability to play in multiple situations. Yeah, he's a total utility guy is what he is. He's a Swiss exactly. Army knife, yeah. He plays hard. He can kill penalties. Dubas also said that he can drive play more than meets the eye. Okay. Now, last year, his shooting percentage must have been abysmal to score one goal in 56 games. So you'd have to believe that that's going to get a little bit better. Yeah. But I'm, I'm sure they're envisioning him as the third line center on this team. And that's another thing I should have brought up is that he is a centerman. So if he's like really he's strong, gonna, he's really strong in the face off circle. They say too. Yeah. Good face off guy as well. So I think he's, he's a stone lock to be one of the bottom six centermen on this team. And, you know, hopefully he provides a little bit more offensive upside than we saw in Chicago but Lapore, give me your take on the on the camp signing yeah again like like total utility guy like every like you mentioned like the guy doesn't score but he's like that legit classic depth center in the way that he's good defensively he's good in the face-off circle apparently he's very a very good penalty killer again like it, it's a cheap deal and when you're getting to those types of guys down in your lineup I'm a 100% offense guy. I think offense drives this sport now. So he's the type of guy that you try to get a la cheap. Like I see these contracts going around to guys and I'm not comparing anyone to David Kampf, better or worse, but you see, you see these contracts going around for certain players who are like responsible or good defensively. It's like, no, when you need that, you can get someone on a cheaper deal. It's the, the, the scores of the guys who get paid, go spend your money there. And I think that's what he is. And like for the type of model the Toronto Maple Leafs like put together when building their hockey team seems to fit fit into it well, right? Again, like responsible, does all the little things right. His underlying numbers are good. And he's probably a coach's dream, a, a guy who's that versatile too. So I'm sure Keith was happy to see him get signed. But yeah, another one where it's like, I talk about the gamble and like, what are the odds this blows up in your face? zero like it's not gonna blow up in your face like he'll be okay or he'll be a bottom six forward and you didn't spend a lot of money on him you didn't give up anything to get him so again it's someone else's money so i'm okay with this and another thing that kyle dubas mentioned is that they had kicked the tires on david camp over the last like couple of seasons they've checked in with the blackhawks okay that's another thing i took from his press conference that he mentioned so i think this is a player that the leafs have had their eye on for the last little while and when he became a ufa they clearly jumped at the opportunity to sign him nice and camp thinks it's a great fit so yeah i mean again it's a it's a low term low money signing with a heck of a lot more upside than downside and you just hope that he finds a role in that bottom six 
and fits in well with this hockey team. Mm. Yeah, uh, sure. Laborde, now it is time to move on to the new goalie who is coming in to join Jack Campbell as the one-two punch on this team. And that man is Peter Morazic. Yes. Who has signed a three-year deal for $3.8 million a season coming from the Carolina Hurricanes, where he spent most of his career. He also spent time with the Detroit Red Wings. Mm-hmm. I believe the Red Wings drafted him. Yes, they did. They drafted oh, him yeah, in 2010. Dude. When the Red Wings drafted him, they thought people thought this guy was Carey Price because look at his talent ceiling. And- yeah, and, and you know what? He got off to a really good start in his career. Like I'm just looking at some of his numbers. Like His first, when he played nine games in 2013, 2014, 927 save percentage. In 2015, nice. 918 save percentage. 921 save percentage in 2015, 2016. So his numbers at the start of his career career are really good. Um, he's he's kind of settled into being like a, I mean, I would say he's a slightly above average goalie with yeah. the ability to to maybe turn into like what we saw Jack Campbell do last season. Like I think he has that in him, Lapore, but mm-hmm. this is a guy with a 910 career save percentage in 277 games. I don't think the Leafs are expecting him to play more than 30 or 40 games. Like I think they're really comfortable with Jack Campbell as the go-to guy, but I wouldn't be surprised one bit Lapore if this is like a, a 50-50 split. It's going to be interesting because at the end of the day they signed him for 3 years and Campbell's only got the one year left. So what happens if Campbell totally outplays him? Now what are you doing? So like I mentioned gambles before, there's a gamble there. Because if you have to re-sign Campbell, then we all know what the Leafs cap, cap space, like that sucks. Or you don't, have to, don't want to have to let him go and then go with the guy who got beat out the year before. But as far as Mrazic goes, like average goalie, average goaltending. And today's NHL, the gaps are so small and so much comes into timing of when guys play well and when guys play poorly. So I like it, like 3.8 million. And what I really like about it is okay, so we have Campbell, who was very strong last year, like historically strong, like to, to be honest. And then you add in Mrazic. So I think, you know, if we did like all the tandems in the NHL, like the Leafs would be like in that middle fat group, like a hey, take your pick at goalies. And you're paying your goalies a combined what? What is it like five and a half million? Yeah, like less than five and a half million. Five and a half for your two for your two goalies. And like if you get and again, it's all about value and where you allocate your money. If you're getting nine one five or whatever it is, nine one seven, nine one eight average NHL goaltending at five and a half million, that's pretty damn good. That's pretty damn good. So and like to your point, like I don't think they're expecting this guy to be like a Vezina trophy candidate, but I just think they see it in the way of value. So, I mean, like, I like it. And to be honest, I think I mentioned to you before, before we got on this thing, it, it didn't get as much hype as I thought it would. Like the Toronto Maple Leafs signing a new goalie. I don't know. Maybe things are just so down in Leafland this summer that no one gets excited about anything or no one gets like, yeah, people were up. just like, ah, whatever. They yeah, signed Mara- Peter Morazic. Yeah. Like, we knew we needed a goalie. Nothing to we get knew, too We needed a goalie. About. We just got him. Like, okay. Like, I mean, they solved, they, they had a problem. They addressed it. And again, kind of like the other guys, you just hope he surprises us, right? So, yeah, I think it's I think it's a really good signing. Like, I, I really do. I don't think it was an overpay at all. I think it's fair market value for Peter Morazic. It's only a three year deal, and like I mentioned, this is a guy who can be like Jack Campbell. Really, he does what you saw from Jack Campbell last season, who had a better save percentage than Carey Price in the playoffs who put up almost a 930 save percentage in the regular season. Like when Peter Morazic is on the top of his game, this is a dude that can save the, cl- save the puck at over a 92% clip. Now, mm-hmm. is he going to do that over a full season? Probably not. But if you're going to you know, have this guy play 30 to 40 games and Jack Campbell is playing, let's say, 45-ish games and these guys are splitting the net, I'm totally cool with going with these two guys as – as your one, two punch in net. So I, I think the Morazic signing um, is going to be a really good one for the Leafs. I, I really believe that. Mm-hmm. All right, Laporte, uh, we are kind of getting to the end of the show here. So I don't want to go through every guy 
on this list of oh, unrestricted wow. free agents. How many guys signed? Like 200 or something was the number. <laughs> yeah, there, there was a ton of, a ton of We have a four-hour episode of the GFP. Bruno and I are going to use our knowledge uh, to spit out information and data about every single player who signed the deal in the NHL. Yeah, we'd have to, this would have to be like a three-hour podcast. But <laughs> before we get off, how about, how about we do this real quick? Give me your best and worst free agent signing best and worst are you catching me off guard with this bruno okay let's Uh, let's uh, go through through the list so just to kind of go through this list real quick i was gonna say am i allowed to pick a guy who is a free agent but signed with his same team yeah yeah absolutely anyone who's a ufa even if they re-signed with the same team so you have Dougie Hamilton, who signed with the Devils, seven years, yeah. nine million. Blake Coleman with the Flames, six years, four point nine million a season. Philip Deneau, six years, five point five with the Kings. Brandon Saw, David Savard, and Mike Hoffman signed with the Montreal Canadiens. Cody CC, a four-year deal for three and a quarter million per year with the Oilers. And uh, Philip Grubauer, who left the Colorado Avalanche to sign a six-year, $5.9 million per year deal with the Kraken. And then guys that stayed on their same teams, you got Taylor Hall, Gabriel Landeskog, Tyson Berry, and Alexander Ovechkin. Yeah. the one that I'll say the one that first popped in my head as far as the best one, it's Taylor Hall. Because again, like, like how I mentioned the whole thing before about like gambling, Taylor, Taylor, we all know what Taylor Hall is. We all know he's talented. We all know he's going to produce. At in today's world of what free agents go for, to get him at six million, and then for four years of term, like you have to give him seven years or whatever. That's a nice one. And and I think you got the Bruins. Let's let's call a spade a spade. The Bruins took advantage of a vulnerable player. This guy has lost a lot. He's been pointed at a lot in the way of like the teams he's been on and just kind of like the bad luck thing, like the, the Taylor Hall jinx. He finds a place in Boston. His agent is Bobby Orr. Coincidence. There are a win. There's a winning culture there. They're an original six organization. He, without sounding cheesy, like he can find a home. It's still a lot of money. It's a nice signing all the way around. And like, everyone's pointing to like, Oh, look how much money he left on the table. Cause of what he could have signed last year. But he signed that eight year deal or so the eight year deal, that $8 million deal with Buffalo for one year. And now signs the $24 million deal with Boston. That's $32 million for five years. And that sounds like he, he can still play after that five years. Like, so what were people really thinking he was going to get like, even like a seven times seven? Well, that's two more years. Like, yeah, he probably lost a little bit of money, but at the end of the day, like the guy still, the guy still got paid. It's still a lot, a lot of dough we're talking about. And he's in a situation he wants to be in. And we talked about before how these guys are different, different personalities, different wants. And to me, it's just a match made in heaven for like Boston, a team that like doesn't overpay players. They like a certain fit. And for Taylor Hall, where he could have got overpaid somewhere, but the guy wants to win. So he chose Boston. So I'll, I'll circle that one. I'll circle that one. That's okay. the best one. I'll, I'll, I'll give my best signing before we get to our worst. Um, but no, it's hard to disagree with everything you said there about Taylor Hall. I think it was a fantastic signing, but for me, I think the best signing by far, even though it was a massive deal was Dougie Hamilton. And you're going to say Hamilton. <laughs> and for the people who know me, you all know that I'm a huge Dougie Hamilton fan. I've talked about him on the podcast numerous times. I think this is a home run signing for the devils. And just like I mentioned earlier in the show, like if you're going to make a splash in free agency, you either make a big splash for a star player. And I do happen to believe that Dougie Hamilton is a, an elite defenseman in the NHL, or you kind of scrape the bottom of the barrel and you sign cheap guys and hope that they hit where you're getting into tons of trouble is when you're signing middle of the road average players to long-term contracts. So Dougie Hamilton is a guy I think is totally worth it. He's 28 years old. He has seven straight seasons of double digit goals. This guy puts up points. He skates like the wind. He moves the puck as well as honestly, almost any defenseman in the league. He can run the point on the power play. He can play on the penalty kill. He can play in all situations. I love this move for the devils now. Is it the best fit for Dougie Hamilton? Like I thought maybe he'd 
go to a team that was a little further along in the process of competing yeah. for a Stanley Cup, but yeah, they got a ton of draft picks. I mean, a ton they of got cap a ton, space too. Yeah, tons of cap space. You got Jack Hughes, who I mean, they hope turns into one of the elite centers in the league at some point. So they got they got some nice young players in the mix, and I just think Dougie Hamilton's an awesome player. I think I I, I think he's one of the top ten defensemen in the league. So good on the New Jersey Devils. If you're going to go in and make a splash in free agency, I think this is the type of player you do it for. So that's my guy. But yeah, the, the Devils as like an organization are sneaky dangerous. Like they just signed Hamilton. Like you said, they have a shit ton of picks. <clears throat> and I forget where I heard it, but some crazy stat where like they only have like one forward over 26 years old or something. Like they're crazy young, no bad contracts. Like the Devils, man, people, the, people like to play in that area so it, it, it'll be interesting to see how like the devils evolve the next couple of years yeah shout out to my buddy wade who is a massive new jersey devils fan and who's when we were golfing fan? i know it's it's random like who's like broder like you like broder as a kid is that the story or something he's the only devils <clears throat> fan i've i've ever known but um he told me a couple of weeks ago we went golfing and i actually didn't know this he said there was a game this past season where the devil suited up and they didn't have a single player, I believe over the age of 23 what? in their lineup. Like it's absurd. So yeah, like this is, this is a team and it, it just happened like one night. That, that's hard like, to do for an AHL team, let alone an NHL. Team. Yeah. It, it's crazy. Eh? So yeah, that's a team that ton of upside with all the young guys they have. Now they bring in Dougie Hamilton. So they brought yeah, back I mean, the, the green, red and white jerseys. Looking, What's that, Laporte? I said they brought back the green, the green, red, and white jerseys like they should have. You so you like that jersey, Bruno? We're canceling the podcast if you say you don't. <laughs> I'm not saying I don't like it. But oh man, not, the Italia the Devils! My list. The Italia Devils, amazing man. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right, that's that's a topic for another podcast. <laughs> yeah. But Laporte, before we before we uh, wrap things up here, give me your your worst UFA signing of 2021. I'm deciding between two. I'm okay. deciding between two. The first one that pops in the head is just the CC deal. He was drafted by Ottawa. Those who listen to the show know I'm, I live in Ottawa. I go to a lot of Sens games. CC, CC's experience in Ottawa here did not end well. Like he was a punching bag for the fans here in Ottawa because he made a lot of mistakes. He was bad in his own end. He doesn't skate well. He doesn't rush the puck. He doesn't score. So he was an easy target for Sens fans. Then he goes to Toronto. He goes to my beloved Leafs so I can watch him every game now. And it was more of the same. I was trying to find something right about this player, something that can that this player contributes, and I couldn't find anything. And here he is signing this deal in Edmonton at that term. Like this guy, he signed that one-year deal in Pittsburgh. Was it for like a million bucks? Last I year, so let me double check. Like, like, how does that happen? Like, hockey's all about like asset management. Like, a guy, so a year ago, a year ago, this guy couldn't find a job in the league for anything better than a team yeah. giving one and a quarter million. He signed for okay. So, here you have like 365. And I guess, no, we're all messed up because of the COVID year. But a year ago, this guy couldn't find a team that would give him more than a year and moreover, not much more than league minimum. What has happened in the last year that you're willing to commit four years and that kind of dough to this guy? I like I I don't understand the yeah, logic. It's absurd. Of, I don't understand the logic of that deal at all. And like these agents, man, like they must be really good at their job, or they're just telling their guys, like, bud, we got to get to free agency because like all it takes is one GM who is not thinking straight to give us a crazy deal. That's what this one looks like. Like, I don't get it at all. Like, even you're saying CC wouldn't have signed like, I don't know, like if someone would have said, told me someone, uh, he was going to sign like a three year, $7.5 million deal. I'd be like, wow, good for Cody CC. And he signed four years at more money. Like that's what, that's what I don't get. Like the term and the, the, uh, the AAV, the other one I was thinking about and people will argue about this one is Philip Deneau and like, the Kings have always kind of been my second favorite team because it's like growing up a Gretzky fan. I don't get that deal at all. Like I know he's playing behind, um, he's playing behind Kopitar and they're hoping like Byfield will, will slide in. But 
it goes both ways. So, so you'll say like, okay, well, we don't need offensive production because we're going to get it from our top six. So then we have him in this role. And, but then to that, I would say, then don't pay him five and a half million dollars is what I would say if, if that's his role and that kind of term. And like, I know that there is such thing as a player who is good defensively, as I touched on earlier in the show, but to give a guy that kind of money and that kind of term who doesn't score points, like to me, it's like blasphemous. Like, like it doesn't make sense. Like, yeah, it's just, I, I don't know. Like, like I, I, I don't get that one at all. And like some of these teams too, like I think they should get far too excited with cap space. And maybe that, that's kind of like the problem that happened with LA. They had cap space and they've had some bad contracts for a while. So maybe they're seeing things kind of like clearing up. And people are saying this, the Kings may be like sneaky good. So like they just thought they would jump on this. But like that's another one where if we had to bet towards like the middle to second half of this contract. It's going to be bad. Oh, it's a slam dunk. It's going to be bad. Like by year four, paying this guy five, five and a half million dollars. And this is when I, I pointed out to people that like, People point to like deals on the Leafs or certain teams with star players making big amounts of money and how it screws you. No, because it's hard to get those guys. It's like paying a guy. I, I think, I think, I think, I think the problem is people make the mistake if they look at it like percentage wise. So it's like, okay, or sorry, they just look at it like number wise, where it's like, okay, let's say you would pay a guy three million or he deserves three million and you pay him four. And it's like, okay, it's only a million more. Or, or, but at the end of the day, but then those same people will point to like a star player who makes like, I don't know, 7.5. And it's like, oh, you know, you probably get him for like six. It's like, well, it, it's like ish the same thing because like, it's the 1.5 million here or the 1 million over there. But people just look at it in the way of like, yeah, you have to look at like in terms of the percentage increase rather than the actual like number increase. Like, you know what I mean? At the end of the day, like a dollar, a million dollars wasted on the cap is a million dollars wasted on the cap. But I'd rather give it wasted. It's a bad word, but people know where I'm going with that. But I'd rather give it to that star player because it's hard to get that star player. So like I'll, I'll quote unquote overpay there. And I hope I explained that right with like percentages and numbers and all that. But I think people know what I mean, where a dollar wasted is a dollar wasted. And I find people are just so quick to point to these like big contracts of star players. And, oh, he makes this. He should make it, they compare him to another star player and they'll say, Oh, he could make that. It's like, yeah, but that team got the star player and this other idiot team is paying all their third liners a million or two too much. And it's five, 6 million too much across the board. That's what kills you. That's what kills you. But. Yeah. I, I think you nailed it with these two contracts. I think the CC one is egregious. Cause I just don't think he's a very good player at all. Like, I don't know how he keeps fooling teams into paying him money <laughs> like you know I mean, people say thing. bruno pe- people say it's like the first round draft pick thing yeah. people say it's, it's like this thing in people's minds these old school gms of like he's a first round draft pick he's a first round i, I can get it out of him he's a first round draft yeah pick. They, they always have that stuck in their heads like yeah like we can we can take cody cc to the next level we can discover something that his previous teams couldn't right we can pair him with this guy on the blue line and he's going to excel but at the end of the day, like Cody Cece is a, a bottom pairing defenseman at best. And you're paying him four years and, and three and a quarter million. That's going to, that's going to be a brutal contract, yeah. but I think you also nailed it with a Dino deal. And again, it just goes back to what I've said. You can't pay guys like this in free agency. Like, I don't want to say Dino is a zero offensively because he's not like there's been seasons like Dino's last best year. Season. He was pretty last year. He was pretty close. Yeah. Like he had, so he had 47 points in 2020 and the year before that in 2018, 2019, 53 points. Yeah. But last season, five goals in 53 games, yeah. 24 points in 53 games in the regular season, one goal in 22 playoff games. And I get it. He's good defensively. He wins face-offs. He's a responsible player. He was like top five in, in voting for the Selkie trophy. But come on, when you're when you're allocating six years and five and a half million dollars to a defensive specialist who's what I'll say about God, bro. who's just gonna continue to get worse offensively, mm-hmm. I think we can all agree. That that's just not gonna look good. It really isn't. And with some of those young guys coming up, like you want Quinton Byfield to be one of your top two centermen. You don't want to be paying Philip Deneau as your number three center, five and a half million dollars a year. A few yeah. years down the line, I and think Byfield, that's, that's Byfield's terrible. Byfield's gonna come out of his entry level deal still with Dano on the books. So yeah, and he, but even the point he made it like people would bring up his points from a couple of years ago. 
Montreal didn't have it like, because he was like Montreal's top line center getting like power, probably getting power play time minutes that he probably yeah, wouldn't he was, get on. He a, was miscast. Like he yes. was never a, never a number one center. And like, he's getting kind of, he got a lot of points because of his minutes, but he wouldn't get those opportunities somewhere else. So yeah, again, the, it, it's a, it's a really, really weird one for me. And I would argue that no player benefited more from the playoffs than Philip Deneau. Hands just down. In terms oh, of like increasing their value as a free, like think about it. Lapore, if, if the Habs lose in the first round to the Leafs, oh my God, does Deneau get this contract? Oh my God. Oh my God. No fucking way he gets this contract. He should be sending half that deal to Carey Price. Too. <laughs> yeah. Like, I think that changed the whole narrative around, you know, a lot of these guys on the Habs, but specifically for Deneau, you know, coming into his UFA offseason after everyone was like, wow, he's shutting down all the opponent's top players. This is yeah. unbelievable. And then there was one team that took the bait and signed him to a six year contract for five and a half million a season. I think it's going to be a terrible contract down the road. Yeah. I really do. To your, like to what you're saying, like a lot of people joke about uh, Justin hole because like the Leafs dominated the Oilers and clearly shut down McDavid this year. So the, like when Justin hole hits free agency, there's going to be some team. that's like, this guy shut down Connor McDavid. And it's like a total joke. That's not how it played out boys, but tell yourself that and make this guy rich. So. Yeah, no, that, that's a great comparison right there, man. But uh, any, any final thoughts before we wrap this thing up? No, that something came through though. Uh, Mark Andre Fleury has agreed to join the Chicago Blackhawks. So that's something, you know, Chicago, Chicago, we need more news out of Chicago lately. Oh, oh God. But uh, yeah, come on. Mark Andre, hopefully he can uh, establish himself there and be a good dude. Like he is everywhere. Right. And be loved. Everyone and loves Mark Andre. Everyone Fleury. loves Mark. Everyone Andre. loves Mark Andre Fleury, except Michael Lepore. Except for Michael Lepore. Yeah. So yeah. Um, one thing I'll say, like there's a few names still out there who I hope get picked up. Just things to talk about, like Joe Thornton's still available. The Dano Chara is still available. So fun to see if those guys get picked up, where they go, and probably some other names that we can't even think of that we'll get alerts on. And, oh, yeah, that guy, he signed here. So never stops, never stops, always fun. Yeah, like you said, Lapore, there's still a few names out there who have yet to sign. Will be interesting to see where those vets sign, like Thornton and Chara. So, yeah, I mean, everyone just keep your eyes peeled. Have those notifications on for all the hockey insiders <laughs> because a lot of these rosters are going to – officially take shape here over the next little while. I mean, obviously we still got to get into training camp and all that stuff. And there's going to be a lot of juggling around then as well. But for the most part, um, when it comes to the Toronto Maple Leafs, I mean, what you're seeing right now is, is what you get. The core yep. four is still in place. Morgan Riley is still here. Jack Campbell and Peter Morazic are in net. It's just a matter of figuring out um, where these forwards are going to land in the lineup. So you know, stay tuned to the GFP podcast because we are going to be all over this all summer long and heading into training camp. We'll be tracking the Leafs. We'll be tracking the rest of free agency. So thank you for listening and watching as always. And that is going to do it for episode 30 of the Gluttons for Punishment podcast or GFP, a Toronto Maple Leafs and NHL podcast hosted by Michael Lepore and Anthony Bruno. I say this at the end of every show. If you enjoyed listening, it would be a big time help. If you give us a five-star rating and review on Apple. And of course, if you're watching us on YouTube, we would appreciate more than you would ever know. If you just smash that like button, it does so much for the YouTube algorithm. Smash that like button, subscribe to the channel and ring the notification bell. So you know exactly when the GFP podcast is dropping some new content. So for Michael Lapore. I'm Anthony Bruno, and we will see you in the next one. Thanks, everyone. Oh,